millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. episode 367 of real life ghost stories and i have two spooky stories for you today and the last story comes from june the 5th 2024 and story number one comes from john here is another experience i have had it's about my gran and a psychic i saw although brief trigger warning for miscarriage and drugs let me start by telling you a bit about my gran she was an amazing woman She was smart, kind, generous, and a phenomenal cook, baker, and gardener. Her chocolate cake was out of this world and is still a recipe I can't master. Me and my friends would go and see her after college, and she would feed us, never taking no or we weren't hungry or we had just eaten as an answer. She is also where I believe some of us in our family got our sense of knowing when there is a spirit or entity around as she would often comment that she could see her dogs, four of them, all passed away and buried in her garden, running around and playing, and that she would often see her second husband, Jim, in the garden shed, pottering about. She would also know things before they happened. I remember her handing my sister a card one Sunday when we had all gone over for dinner, and when my sister opened it, the card read, Congratulations on your baby girl. This was well before the scan to say what sex the baby would be. She did the same thing a few years later when my sister was pregnant with my nephew. Again, well before the scan for what the sex of the baby would have been. Yet, looking back to my sister's first pregnancy, there was no card. Just a very big, tight hug and Gran saying to her, it'll be okay. This was the baby my sister lost. Gran passed the day before my sister's 28th birthday, two days before my 18th on the 31st of August 2000, and my world broke. I'm crying now while writing this, but if I stop, I won't continue. Her passing, I hope, was peaceful. She had COPD and was on oxygen. Her death was ruled an accident. But I'm not sure, as she wasn't one to forget things. I mean, she would be up to all hours playing online Scrabble with people from all around the world. She had gone to the kitchen to get a cuppa. To do this, she would have to turn the oxygen off in her living room, take the tube out from under her nose and walk through the dining room, to then sit on the bench in her hall, outside the kitchen door, put the oxygen mask on and turn the lever to get oxygen flowing. This day, however, the oxygen didn't flow as she had forgotten to turn it off in the living room. Not like her at all. Instead of calling someone for help, her stubborn ass decided to walk back to the sofa and turn the oxygen off. She didn't make it and was found on the dining room floor. I was so distraught that I didn't want to do anything or see anyone, and I think as I was in such grief, I was subconsciously shutting myself off to all the energies around me, as things got quiet. Then about two weeks or so after she died, I had the most vivid, technicolor dream, and still remember every moment, sound and smell of it right to this day. I was walking up to her house. I went through the black metal gate and up the little path in the front garden, up the one little step onto her porch and knocked on the brown painted wooden door. The door opened and I walked into my grand's house as I had a thousand times before, The stairs on the left of me, the kitchen with its sliding door in front, something baking in the oven, and to the left, the dining room. 
I walked through the dining room and turned right through the dark wood and glass panelled double doors to the living room. There she was in her spot on the left hand side of the sofa. Only this time there was no tube under her nose feeding her oxygen and she looked so much younger. She was 83 when she passed but now looked like she was in her early 50s. She patted the sofa next to her and I went over and sat on her right side. She told me things would be okay and she was now happy and she was better and able to do all of the things she used to. She then took me outside and we got in a car. She didn't drive when she was alive. We set off down an empty road and she said I had to get through this bit to get to the good stuff. The next thing I remember seeing were billboards and they all had me on them. At college, working, out with friends and on holidays. Some had other people in them but I couldn't see them properly. When I asked why, my gran said they are people you meet. People who will become friends or that you will fall in love with. We then pulled up outside her house and got out of the car. Gran looked at me and said, Now we say goodbye for a bit, but don't worry, I'll have chocolate cake waiting for you. She hugged me and went inside. I woke up crying. Around a year and a half later, a friend, now ex-friend, paid for me to see a psychic. Before leaving my bedsit, I sat and asked my gran to come. My friend picked me up and we went to the psychic cafe. We got there and ordered some coffees and let them know we were there for a reading. When this reading was booked, it was only under first names, so zero chance of them looking up anything. My friend went down first and about an hour later came back up. We sat and chatted and then my name was called. I went down the short stairs to the basement and along a hallway. I got to a door that was slightly ajar and knocked. A man's voice from inside said, yeah, come on in. Hi, he said, my name's Calvin and you must be Jonathan. He shook my hand and asked me to sit. Right, he said. Some rules. Yes or no only. Mmm, and I'm not sure are not valid answers. He sat for a moment with his eyes closed and then said, You've asked this person to be here today. You asked them while sat on your bed. I was dumbfounded. I had been sitting on my bed when asking. He then said, This is a lady with a very matriarchal energy. Does that make sense? I said yes, with a bit of a croak. He then went on to say, She's showing me big family meals and lots of cooking, is that right? Again, I said yes and went to say more, but he stopped me and just said yes or no, remember? No more information than that. He then said, Are you doing drugs? And I replied no. He laughed and moved his right hand quickly in a downwards motion and said a little sternly, Don't lie. I blubbed like a baby, and this is the exact way Gran would slap your legs if you were sitting next to her on the sofa and you were being cheeky or lying. Calvin said that she's saying you don't need to smoke to reach what you want. After this is a bit of a blur now. I have a recording of the reading somewhere, but for the life of me I can't find it. What I do remember was near the end of the reading Calvin said... She's asking why you never told her that you're gay. And she says that it doesn't matter to her who you love as long as you're happy. Again, more of me sobbing. He told me we had reached the end of our time and asked if I had any questions. So I asked, where in the room is she? He didn't need to answer because as I asked, I felt a very cold sensation move around my back and side of my head. Calvin said, she's sitting next to you. I managed to squeak out, I know, I feel her hugging me. I said thank you and stood up to leave the room. Calvin stopped me in my tracks. All he said was, it wasn't a dream. She wants you to know that it happened. It just wasn't here. I think that meant my dream took place on Grand's plane of existence and not ours. The experience taught me that although we will hurt and grieve when a loved one dies, they're not really gone. They've just changed form or gone back to energy. It reminds me of the poem Death is Nothing at All by Henry Scott Holland. Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped away to the next room. 
I am I and you are you. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference into your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed, at the little jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me. Pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without the trace of a shadow on it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same that it ever was. There is absolute unbroken continuity. Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am but waiting for you, for an interval, somewhere, very near, just around the corner. All is well. Oh, that poem, honestly, it just, it's so beautiful and I also think it's so poignant and I think it's a lovely thing to kind of listen to and remember and think you know when we talk about people who have died it's okay to celebrate them and talk about them happily and laugh about things that you did together and I love that line where it's like put no difference into your tone wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow where it's like no you can you can talk about death and people who have died And you can talk about them in funny ways and with joy and lightness. And it doesn't always have to be dark and sorrowful. I'm sure there are plenty of people listening to the podcast today who might have needed to hear that. And John, your grand sounds like she was an amazing person. And what a gift to have. I mean, the confidence to hand your sister a card saying like congratulations on your baby girl. Like that is confidence in your own abilities. And I am here for that. And it's pretty amazing that she was accurate, you know, and accurate on all three pregnancies that she had recognized that, you know, one would be a nephew, one would be a niece. And unfortunately, the first the first pregnancy, there was no card. She obviously had some sort of knowing that, you know, your sister was going to lose the baby, which mustn't be the nicest thing to be carrying around with you and being aware of. You know what I mean? And that psychic that you went to see sounds great, you know, sounds really, really great only yes or no answers, don't give me any information and seems to have been really accurate and I'm really glad that that psychic was able to turn to you and say, hey, that dream that you had about your grandmother, that wasn't just a dream, that really was her. And I think the visitation dreams, they do have a different quality, they have a different feel to them than other dreams. It's a very strange thing to experience, I think. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey, it's Danny Pellegrino from Everything Iconic. Ready to upgrade your style game without blowing your budget? Check out Quince. They've got all the good stuff, shirts and polos, activewear and fine leather goods, all at 50 to 80% less than other high-end brands. And the best part? They're all about safe, ethical and responsible manufacturing. Get that luxury vibe without the luxury price tag. Hit up quince.com slash upgrade for free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince.com slash upgrade. And story number two comes from Amanda. This story takes place around 2013, 2014. I was age 23 or 24 at the time, but first a little background. My mum was a stewardess of a golf club in the countryside in a small village called Ratho, which offered a very old and very grand former mansion turned clubhouse to its members. As my mum was the stewardess of the club, she inherited a flat situated inside the golf club as part of the job. I assume that was once the living quarters for the mansion's housekeeping staff. My mum and I lived in this flat quite happily. The building was built in 1824, so there were often stories of staff members and club members hearing and seeing unexplained things in the clubhouse. 
At night, when there was no one around, its large, high-ceilinged rooms and grand hallways could get quite eerie. As it was in the countryside with greenery all around, when it snowed, it looked like a scene from The Shining. But I found this more peaceful than anything else. Even in the flat we lived in, often we would see a shadow walk past the living room door. Furniture moving around my mum's room. The dog staring down the hallway and whining at nothing. One time I even woke up to my bed shaking and as soon as my eyes were fully open, it stopped. Despite this, this presence never felt like a threat and I never felt at all uneasy. I'm pretty good at picking up energies and even with the occasional spooky moment, I never felt unsafe. I felt that whatever presence happened to be there was friendly and it never bothered us much at all. It wasn't until I fled the nest and moved in with my then partner that I realised just what an unfriendly presence felt like. My experience takes place in an old mining town called Bonus, just on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Before moving in with my then partner, I would often stay over and occasionally I would get this feeling of being watched. Or if my partner popped out, I never felt like I was alone. I felt this presence originating from the hall of the flat. For whatever reason, it always came from the hallway. So no matter which room I was in, I felt I was always being watched and whatever it was could always see me from the hallway. Before moving in, this was the only spooky feeling I remember. But when I moved in permanently, the feelings intensified. The feeling of being stared at from the hallway never left me. Sometimes my partner would be working night shifts, leaving me in the flat on my own. And I could always feel myself wanting to take a little side glance over to the hallway door whilst trying to watch the TV because I felt something looking at me. I had mentioned this to my partner at the time. I asked him if he had ever felt anything, but he was a total skeptic, didn't believe what I was saying and told me my mind was playing tricks on me. As time went on, more and more things started to happen. Small things to begin with. For example, I had a mirror in the corner of the bedroom where I would kneel on the carpet, do my hair and makeup, get ready for work, etc. This one occasion I was kneeling in front of the mirror with the bedroom door to the right of me, touching up my makeup and all of a sudden, it went deadly quiet. The next sound I heard was footsteps on the carpet in the bedroom. It sounded like footsteps had come from the hallway into the bedroom. In the silence, all I heard was the crunching of carpet beneath its feet. I heard four distinct steps. And then it stopped. Just four or five feet away from me. I felt my stomach drop. A feeling of unease came across me like a wave. At this point, out of fear, I hadn't turned to look. I had also noticed I had stopped breathing, adding to the silence. I very, very slowly raised my head and turned to the right towards the door and saw nothing. Although my eyes never saw anything in front of me, my heart and soul knew what I had heard. I sat there for about 30 seconds, just waiting. I don't know what I was waiting for, to be honest, but as nothing more seemed to come of it, I noticed my breathing started to regulate and I turned to continue my routine with the occasional side glance towards the bedroom door into the hallway, my body still on high alert. The next example may seem a little insignificant, but it felt significant to me. The bedroom door was always a little stiff as it brushed up against the carpet, So when opening and closing the door, you needed to use a bit of force. For this reason, the bedroom door mainly stayed open, except for when going to bed at night. One morning, I was alone in the flat and I was getting myself ready to jump in the shower. I left the bedroom to make my way into the bathroom. Once showered, I came out, turned to walk into the bedroom and the door was fully closed. I knew for a fact I did not close this door behind me when leaving the room and there was no way it could swing itself closed due to the friction on the carpet. Very insignificant to some people, but to me it was a sign. I'd always had a feeling of dread, unease and heaviness since moving in, 
I did not feel welcomed by this presence. I felt like this presence was very unhappy about me being here, and I felt closing the door behind me was a message telling me to stay out. Again, I mentioned this to my partner, but again he shrugged it off. This is when it starts to get really unsettling. One morning I had gotten ready for work and was a little early. This was back in the day when Jeremy Kyle was on the TV, so I sat and watched it to kill time. Looking at the clock on the wall, it was about time to leave, but the results hadn't been read out on Jeremy Kyle yet, so I grabbed my bag and made my way over to the TV, hanging on the wall with my finger on the power button. My plan was to hear the results, switch off the TV and dash out the door. I stood there with my finger on the button for about 10 to 20 seconds in anticipation, waiting on the lie detector results. I should note, this standing position I was in meant I had my back to the door entering the living room. Out of nowhere, I felt something run at me fast from the hallway. I didn't hear any footsteps on the wooden floor, nor did I feel anything before this. I just suddenly felt what what I can only describe as a big heavy mass come right at me, and it came at me at some speed. This feeling made me duck with my hands covering my head out of instinct to protect myself. I quickly turned to look behind me and, of course, there was nothing there. Having no explanation for what I just felt and feeling very confused, I thought, screw the results, and left for work immediately. After this, I started looking into house blessings and burning sage and wondered if I had to get someone in for that or if this was something I could do myself. I made a mental note to look into this further. I wish I could say this was the most frightening thing that happened to me in that flat, but unfortunately not. My next experience was nightmare fuel. Writing out this part of my experience still gives me the chills. It fills me with dread and I can feel my heart fluttering already. One October morning, around 5am, my partner's alarms went off for work. He started at 6am and I happened to start at 7am this day. Being October, it was still pitch black outside at this time in the morning. I heard him get up and make his way into the bathroom to shower. As soon as he closed the door behind him, I felt something was very off. I felt panicky all of a sudden, like I didn't want him to leave for work and leave me by myself. I didn't know why I felt like this. At 5am in the morning I should be feeling sleepy and sluggish. Instead I was wide awake, like I was in a fight or flight state with no reason to be. But my body could sense that something was very wrong, and it was trying to tell me something. My partner got out of the shower and began getting dressed for work. During this time I toyed with myself, wondering whether I should say something should I tell him how unsafe I felt right at this moment in time? With him brushing off my previous experiences, I ended up not saying anything. Even if I did, I still feel he would have left anyway, as, again, he wouldn't have believed me and would have made me feel silly. He left, and I thought to myself, right, just get up and get ready for work and leave as soon as possible. I jumped in the shower, washed, and made my way back to the bedroom throwing my clothes on as quickly as I could. I felt like I needed to hurry. Next, I shit you not, all the lights in the flat went out, like a power cut had just taken place. I was left in darkness. No lights, and with it being completely dark outside, no outside light was making its way in. I honestly could not see a hand in front of my face, and unfortunately this was a time before we had torches on our phones. The next thing I heard, the shower dripping into the bath, as if it had been turned back on but not fully. I knew it had to be this thing playing with me. Was it there when I woke up? Was that what my body was trying to tell me? Did it wait until my partner left so it could scare me? The shower then stopped. It was deadly silent again and I couldn't see a thing. I stood still for a few seconds at the other side of the bed, facing the pitch black hallway, knowing I was going to have to walk towards it to get out. The only thing I could hear was my heart beating in my ears. It was beating so hard and fast. I felt like my senses were heightened to the max. 
It took me a while to muster up the courage to take small steps towards the hallway, where I felt this thing was waiting for me. I knew it was there. I felt it standing at the door looking in at me and I had to walk towards it. I did so very slowly, with my heart absolutely pounding, with my hand out in front of me, praying that it didn't encounter anything. I can honestly say I've never felt so terrified in my life. I felt my way along the wall to the door frame, quickly ran through the hall and into the kitchen, where the front door was situated. No lights would turn on and I don't know what on earth made me think to do this, probably desperation, but I opened the fridge door to get light. Thankfully, that light was still working. Even with the fridge door open, it was still very dark and I could only see shadows created by the furniture. My eyes darted to the door to the hallway and I couldn't see anything. The light from the fridge didn't reach that far. At this point, I was very aware of how heavy I was breathing and my body was still telling me this is not okay. I was able to reach for the front door handle without looking. I did not dare to take my eyes off the direction of the hallway and I did not even dare to blink. I opened the door and ran out to my car that was only a few feet away as we were on the ground floor. Relieved I was out. However, one realisation made my heart sink. I had left my car keys inside. Through tears I had to muster up the courage again to go back into that house and get my keys. I was shaking but I had no other choice. I left the front door wide open and I left the fridge door open for light. I sprinted in and grabbed my keys. Feeling that this thing was near me, I ran straight back out the door. I slammed the door shut behind me. Standing outside, I took a moment to compose myself. I knew my partner would be annoyed if I didn't lock the door. Our front door had glass panels with patterns on them. Not frosted, but it meant you still had a bit of privacy, but still letting light from the outside come in. I walked towards the front door and began to lock it. Something in my head told me, do not look up. I listened to this voice. I did not dare look up from the lock as I felt something was staring at me through the door and I didn't want to see it. I left, drove to work, I was super early and I just remember sitting in the back office by myself for a while until other staff members started to come in. I remember one manager looking at me very strangely, wondering why I was in so early, looking rather dishevelled, with no hair or makeup done. I can't remember if I told my manager the full story, but I'm pretty sure I just told her that I needed to get out of the house because I didn't feel right in there and left it at that. I remember I made sure that my partner was home before me that day. When I got home, I told him everything. I felt tears well up in my eyes, reliving what had gone on that morning. He walked to the switch cupboard, shrugged his shoulders and showed me that a fuse had blown. I didn't care. I knew what had happened and what I had felt, not only this morning but also in my previous experiences. I wanted to swing for him. He had disregarded everything I had ever told him. I think we moved out not long after that and we aren't together anymore. Looking back on it now, I think he must have felt something was up with the flat but didn't want to admit it. Maybe he didn't want to confirm my concerns and worry me more, or maybe he didn't want to admit to it himself, that there was something there and he didn't want to acknowledge it. I'm with a wonderful man now, living together in Edinburgh. I'm pleased to say that I don't feel anything in this flat, nothing but happiness. I feel that if I were to experience anything like this again, he would listen to me. Although he is not a believer himself, he respects my beliefs and wouldn't wave off my feelings of unease or discomfort, and for this I am truly grateful. I have driven through the small town of Bowness occasionally since moving out of that flat, and I often wonder if I should take a detour down the street where I once lived. I am curious to see what that flat and its surroundings look like now, but what stops me doing that is the fact that if I were to drive past, I would also be driving past the bedroom window, and I am terrified that I would see something looking back out at me. I never want to come into contact with that presence again. So I stay away. So I recorded this story, went away, did some bits. Now I am back to record my thoughts about this story. And as I was away, like bopping around doing my bits and pieces and thinking about this story, I just got more and more irked by it. Not by the story, to be clear. Um, but by 
the flippancy and the kind of dismissiveness of your partner in this story. And I know this is not the most important part of the story, but I just have to say that people are allowed to experience things and feel things and not have an explanation for them. And it is nobody's place to make anyone feel stupid or feel silly for having an experience that made them feel frightened, whatever that experience was. And even if that thing is a literal nightmare where there is a reasonable explanation, you know it was a nightmare, you know it wasn't real. But even if it even if it is that and it made you feel frightened, like that's a legitimate feeling. That fear is legitimate and nobody should be dismissive of that. And even if you don't believe, even if you think there is a really reasonable explanation for this, there's a way to have that conversation with somebody without making them feel silly or without being dismissive of the things that they are feeling. And I think I feel particularly sensitive about this because I get it all the time when I tell people what I do for a living. For the most part, people are lovely and they're more so in disbelief about the fact that I make money out of out of this. You know what I mean? They're like, that's your job. But equally, it, it gets frustrating when people are like, <laughs> sorry, ghosts aren't real. You know, you know that, right? And I had somebody ask me recently when I was talking about what I did for a living. I had somebody ask me, what, so you, you actually believe in ghosts? And I said something like, well, not particularly. I'm, I'm probably more of an open-minded skeptic. And they sort of laughed and said, oh, yeah, that's the right answer. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure that it is. I think actually anybody's beliefs are the right answer to them, you know, and that's OK. And look, maybe I'm just too sensitive and I've had too much therapy, but I just feel like if you are frightened by something and it is making you uncomfortable, it's on your mind, it's worrying you, then really the other people in your life, your important people in your life should not be dismissing that and making you feel silly about it, even if they don't believe that it's supernatural, even if they don't believe in ghosts. They should be kind of big enough, respectful enough, self-reflective enough to go, hey, if I felt really frightened like this, I'd probably want somebody to support me, not somebody to tell me that I'm stupid for believing that it's supernatural or not somebody to tell me that I'm stupid for being frightened. Oh, that was a bit of a rant. I'm sorry, I apologise. It's obviously, it's obviously something that really gets gets on my nerves in this line of work. I think for me, it has the same energy as, you know, when you say to somebody, oh yeah, I've, I actually didn't, didn't like that film. And they're like, what? Like, how could you not like that film? It's the best film ever made, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, I just, I just didn't like it. I'm sure some people find it good. I just didn't like it. Or when you say to somebody, oh, my favorite band is this. And they're like, how is they're just not a good band and you're like well no I like them and I'm sure lots of other people do too it's okay for people to believe different things and it's okay for people to like different things why am I still going about this right let's get back to the paranormal aspects of this story because that's why we're all here first of all it's interesting that this story starts with Amanda living in a haunted house you know the flat on the golf course which by the way has blown my mind didn't know that was a thing for a stewardess of a golf course um But recognizing that this spooky things happened, but it wasn't scary, you know, but obviously whatever was in this, whatever was in this flat in Bowness, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, so I apologize. But whatever that was, obviously had a completely different feeling and felt negative. As somebody who's never lived in a haunted house, I can only imagine that if I suddenly lived in a haunted house, I I would feel frightened either way because I wouldn't have anything to compare it to. You know, I'd be like, this feels terrifying. But in this instance, there is something to compare it to. And Amanda has gone, oh, actually, the last time it didn't feel threatening. But this time, it feels really threatening. And I wonder if, like, obviously, your partner at the time was sceptical. I wonder if they dismissed things that happened to to them or if what happened was kind of centered around you because the things that happen to you in this story you know the footsteps that are coming towards you and just standing watching you that feeling of being watched all the time that feeling of that door was definitely open and now it's closed 
and also you know when you're watching Jeremy Kyle and for audiences from other parts of the world Jeremy Kyle is like Jerry Springer that kind of vibe but British um, and kind of feeling that energy rushing towards you like it all feels like it's sort of designed to frighten you to make you feel panicky to make you to get your attention in a negative way it almost has that sort of look at me energy about it you know I am powerful and I can do these things and I do think our bodies do tell us when something is wrong you know like that feeling of waking up in the morning and being like oh my god I do not want my partner to leave I am frightened something is going to happen and I don't know what it is because you're right you wake up at five o'clock in the morning you should be in that like kind of sleepy in between state where you're like oh I can't be arsed getting out of bed and I'm cozy and I'm warm but no you immediately had fear and I think your body does tell you like when your body was like your brain was like do not look up it mm, I feel, I feel like that was some sort of protection something in your brain being like we can't do this we can't rationalize this or quantify this and if you see what is looking at you from out that window you are not going to come back into this house again and this is another of those stories where I would love to know the history of the house or if the people that have lived there since have had any experiences but it sounds absolutely terrifying and even more difficult when you can't share that fear with anybody you know I apologize for my ranting about people not (laughs) being respectful of other people's beliefs if you listen closely, you can also hear me lose my THs when I'm when I'm ranting. I go particularly Irish, I think, when I'm ranting and particularly Midlands in Ireland. And I lost my THs along the way. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to John and Amanda for sending in your stories. Remember, the last story comes from June the 5th, 2024. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast.gmail.com. You can also check out the website, reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad-free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. Hello, this is Danny Pellegrino, host of the Everything Iconic podcast, and I'm here to tell you all about Splash Refresher, because hydration is mandatory, but boring is not. Now, I love my water, but if I don't spice it up, I'm not going to finish what I took out of the fridge. That's why I love my Splash Refresher, which is flavorful, delicious, bright, hydrating, and zero calories. The wild berry flavor is my fave. No, wait. Is the pineapple mango flavor my fave? You know what? All five craveable Splash Refresher flavors are my fave because they're so delicious. So get hydrated and enjoy it with Splash Refresher.